So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, to this uh, UBC students panel. Um, I'm just going to give you some uh, housekeeping information just uh, to get us started. Um, so please stay muted uh, during the session. Um, use the chat if you want to ask any questions, share your thoughts. Um, you We're going to be using as well uh, Padlet. Um, and I'm just going to put the, the link in the chat. Um, and thanks, Lucas, for doing it as well. Uh, so you can either ask the questions in the chat or use the uh, the, the Padlet. Uh, this session is also being recorded. Uh, so we're going to have a, a video at the end uh, also available for those who cannot attend this session today. So I just want to acknowledge the fact that I'm joining you today uh, from the UBC campus, uh, located on the ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam people. This place has been a place of learning for centuries, and our panel discussion is informed today by the talking circles that were traditionally used and continue to be in indigenous sacred ceremonies. They provide a structure where the voice of each person present is given equal weight. Each voice is acknowledged and heard in turn. And as moderator, I'll make sure that our panelists have equal opportunity to contribute to the discussion. So welcome. Uh, my name is Manuel Diaz. I am uh, an educational consultant at the Center for Teaching, Learning and Technology. Uh, and I will be the moderator of, of, the, pan of the panel today. Today, we delve into an enriching exploration of how students are using Gen AI in their learning. Our panelists will discuss what motivates them to integrate Gen AI into their learning journey and the varied aspects driving this adoption and the benefits that emerge. They will address the potential issues arising from its use, such as academic integrity, privacy, concerns regarding equity and inaccess. The panel will examine the critical aspect of evaluating the quality and reliability of Gen AI outputs in the context of learning processes. So you're welcome to post your questions in the chat. I'm glad to have my colleague Lucas right today. Um, he will moderate uh, the chat throughout the session and answer your questions as well. So to discuss this topic with us today, I'm pleased to welcome Jacqueline Fong, graduate student, Masters of Library Science and Digital Tattoo, Digital Tattoo Student Coordinator, Faculty of Arts, William Khan, Combined Major in Computer Science and Math, Manzura Katun, graduate student from the English Department, Faculty of Arts, Gabriel Emmanuel Setiadi, undergraduate students in Behavioral Neuroscience, Faculty of Science, Elena Wright, graduate student from the MET program, Faculty of Education. So without further ado, I'm starting with the first question. According to a recent KPMG survey, 60% of the students are using Gen AI in their studies. I'm interested in understanding the different ways you are incorporating it into your learning. So as a student, how do you use Gen AI in your learning and what motivates you to use it? And can you describe specific tasks? So maybe we can have an answer from each of you. Um, who would you like to go first? Um, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, thank right. you. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jacqueline. So um, one way that I usually use Gen AI for is to proofread my own work after completion. So um, because uh, the assignments in my the courses that I'm taking are usually essays or reflective papers. So it's, uh, they are quite long. And if I finish them like late in the night, then uh, it's quite time consuming for me to proofread the whole thing. So usually uh, I'm using Gen AI um, uh, to be specific, usually ChatGPT to uh, proofread my work. And using um, Gen AI can actually save um, me a lot of time and it helps uh, it helps me to write in a more concise and also clear manner. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Who wants to take this one on? I'm happy to go next. Okay. Um, 
one of the ways that I really like using Gen AI is beyond Chat GBT, other platforms that are uh, Gen AI, but also not necessarily um, producing uh, written outputs. So things like Research Rabbit is really helpful. Um, I'm a graduate student. I do a lot of research. I'm looking at bibliographies all day. That's my bread and butter. And so it's really helpful to have those kind of tools to help find other readings or research to compile bibliographies. And I also really like that with a lot of these Gen AI tools, there are auto automations that connect with one another. So I can connect Research Rabbit to Zotero, which is a well-used uh, bibliography citation machine, which makes it really easy for me to link all of my research together. Um, and so I really like using it for that purpose. Thank you, Elena. Who wants to take this uh, this on next? Yeah, I can go next. So I am super tracking. I use it mostly with proofreading, sometimes with brainstorming at the beginning, especially when I have to write a paper and I'll just give the prompts. I have this idea, this idea, and the ways to connect it, and then it will give me the beginning to start with. I also use outside uh, chat GPT. I also use uh, Midjourney because um, at times I have to bring in some specific images that could express the work I'm doing. So in that case, I give the prompt with very specific detail of my work and they will generate a certain type of images for that. Thank you, Manzura. So William or Gabriel? Yeah, yeah, I'll go next. So to compare it to say internet search, what makes it different or perhaps better? I would say first is personalization. You can ask questions that potentially have not been asked before and always get an answer. That could be a double-edged sword because it could make up an answer. And I think it's also great for coming up with examples. If you don't understand something, hey, create some examples to help me understand this concept. And if you don't understand it, you can always follow up. So it's kind of like a interactive dialogue. But as a student, in the first eight months it came out, I was actually on co-op, so I wasn't like studying. So I saw like the turmoil it was causing, and I was kind of getting excited to come back into school and start using ChatGPT. But I have not used it nearly as much as I thought I would throughout the term, mainly because there's a clear separation between the learning side of school and then the application side of school. So in terms of learning, understanding, stuff that I would Google before, that's perfectly fine. But I think the mere existence of ChatGPT kind of motivates that like laziness because it's like having the answers at the back of the textbook. And that's why I kind of want to stay away from, try to not just look at the answer or do things that would not or circumvent the effort needed to learn. So anything that's understanding related, yep, that's great. But if it comes to doing like assignments or applying the knowledge, then I stay away from it. And, and William, just in case, like which version of GPT are you using, if you don't mind me asking? I use GPT-4, but I've also tried like perplexity and local AI models. Thank you. Gabriel? Yeah, um, I'm glad to share my experience. So um, most of my experience with AI is with ChatGPT and Humana AI. Um, these are the tools that I was encouraged to use actually by uh, my professor. Um, and so the way I use it is I use it as like a another student or another friend or even like a tutor. Um, to sort of get a different perspective since my um, major really revolves around reading and summarizing research paper. So most of my motivation is one to get that other perspective for another student who might understand the research paper in a different way. That's how I see AI, so as like a study buddy. Um, but I also use it um, to, um, just like what William said, just to improve my understanding and to paraphrase certain paragraphs or questions to sort of simplify the language as well. Um, sometimes because like uh, some research papers might uh, be too technical in their language. And so that's how I um, use AI in my language. Okay, and, and just Gabriel, because you mentioned that this is something that your instructor encouraged you to do. Um, so, is that something that you know your other classmates have been doing heavily, or did you have a sense that some some students were not necessarily responding to that sort of encouragement? Um, yes. So I think once the instructor encouraged it, it was basically used by the whole class. Um, so what was 
Um, what I'm really grateful for as well uh, with my uh, professor, uh, Rebecca Todd, Dr. Rebecca Todd, um, she actually showed us and encouraged us to use it in our discussions of research papers during the class. And so we can see where the AI can go wrong. Um, so that was like really helpful to see as well. And also it was nice to have an instructor um, who can guide us into how to use AI and like, tell us like, what are some caveats around it? And so, yeah, it became a really useful tool to like uh, be more efficient when it comes to reading like a research paper that's like 30 pages long and uh, things like that, yeah. Thank you, Gabriel. And I can see uh, a few questions on the Padlet. I'll be uh, I'll be addressing some of them a little bit later because some of them touch on you know hallucinations. So uh, uh, make sure that we we give an answer to this one. Um, all right, thank you, everybody. Anybody wants to add anything else to these questions? We've, we've got a lot of questions today, but uh, you're welcome to add anything else if you want to. So my second question is about academic integrity. Uh, so we know it's been a space of, of, of contention at university at UBC. Um, and I'm interested in, in the extent you consider academic integrity in your use of Gen AI. Um, and for this, I'm interested in, uh, in William and Gabriel's response. So who would like to take this one first? Okay, yeah, I'll go first. So I know uh, CTLT or someone provided Gen AI syllabus language that you can put into your syllabus. And that's a great starting point. But I'll just say that you should probably be more specific. If we learn anything from prompting is to be specific and give examples. And that makes it easier to follow. For example, if your assignments you want, you allow the use of it, but you need to cite it, then how exactly do you want it to be cited? Because that's not a question that we kind of know how to do. Do we just want to say this is how you use it, or do you want to provide, say, like the actual chat conversation? So try to be specific in how you want it to be cited. That makes it just easier to follow, like these academic integrity rules, because it is important. Like, if students don't understand the concept, they really should not be passing the course. That's not good for anyone or the university. And I would also say that, again, if you make it easy and reasonable to follow, then that makes it easier for students to comply. If you say, don't use chat the entire course, that doesn't really make sense because it's kind of like saying, do not use the internet in my course. That's hard to follow. And you'll probably break that rule at some point and you broke that rule that, oh no, like I already broke your rules. So try to be specific, break it down. Like, do not use it on assignments, do not use it on the finals. Like that's very reasonable. And if you give clear guidelines, it's easier for students to follow as well. So maybe, uh... A follow-up question on that. So uh, how would you like this sort of conversation to happen? Because we, you know, we always uh, advise instructors to put a lot of instructions and guidelines in the syllabus. Um, and I always assume if students read the syllabus carefully. So if that's something that you would like to have, a, a, you know, a conversation early on in the class with a prof. Yeah, I would say definitely have a chat in the beginning of the year. Especially if you believe that generative AI is detrimental to students' learning, that doesn't mean you should just ban it outright completely in the course. Certain things definitely ban it because they need to demonstrate they actually know the material. But rather, if you think it's detrimental, just say at the beginning of the year, like, hey, you can use ChatGPT, cite it, but if you are over-reliant on it, you're going to fail the course when it matters the most. So that's something you can just talk about at the beginning of the year. And that, I think, discourages people from, I guess, using it for malicious means. Thank you, William. Gabriel? Yeah, so I think just to add on what um, William already said. Um, so for me, I was, um, my experience with AI as well, um, since I'm a co-op student and I have had an opportunity to test um, some um, AI tools that claim to be able to help with doing quizzes, um, what the general finding um, that we found is that because AI is made by humans um, and humans even with great minds still make mistakes, um, AI also still makes mistakes as well. So with um, throughout the testing, although it is uh, very 
um, it's very impressive to see um, how um, AI is able to answer most of the questions. When the questions become more sophisticated and more specific, that's when it starts to break down and um, doesn't really become as useful. So just to add on some of the guidelines that Julian has already um, laid out for us, another thing that um, I think would be really useful uh, to promote academic integrity is actually for instructors to go over how the AI works. So just like in my Psych 365 course, um, in that same course that I uh, was um, talking about during my intro, our professor actually uh, went through and showed us that um, the AI is really dependent on the input that we give. So she purposely put a research paper that is biased and it skewed the result, it misinterpreted the results just to get into the journal. She purposely put a terrible research paper there. And when we asked questions to the AI, AI it actually um, like gave us an answer to sort of like support those wrong interpretations. So I think showing students um, in the guidelines, like showing students how um, it's not perfect and it should be used as more as a tool rather than like, um, like an all knowing sort of like <laughs> being uh, that can like um, help you get good grades. Um, seeing that um, the, how it can go wrong will actually encourage students to still think critically of the output that the AI gives you. Um, so yeah, that's where I will um, end um, there. Thank you, Gabriel. And it's just a question that I think is perfect for you, maybe related to the previous question, but somebody was asking in Padlet um, if ChatGPT can provide references. And as you, as you do lots of research and looking for uh, different articles out there and, you know, uh, doing some analysis and review for you. So uh, what can you say about that question if provide, if GPT can provide references? Um, yeah, uh, I think with chat GPT, um, when it comes to references, um, they can, they will definitely look up like through um, most of the search engine or um, to provide us like, oh, where did this paper come from? Um, and where did this idea come from? Um, it's able to do that, but uh, that's still also like kind of limited to um, the version of ChatGPT that you use. And also, again, uh, sometimes we have to be aware of even the references that they give, because it can also be really based on um, like previous input that you put into the chat prompt. And so if there was, um, hallucination from the AI that you did not catch because um, like maybe uh, your mastery level is not um, that proficient to catch that hallucination to fact check the um, information that you put out. It can actually also uh, give you the wrong reference as well. So that's a caveat that I found as well. Yeah. Thank you. And before I let you go and move on to the next question, there's another question that, that is of interest. Uh, somebody asking if um, you are aware of, you know, your instructors using AI detectors to check your assignments. Is that something that you're aware? Uh, what can you say about that? Um, so unfortunately, with my experience, I've only been in a class uh, where the professor does encourage us to use AI. Um, and I was not informed, um, at least if the instructors were using AI detectors. So I think this would be uh, maybe a better question for other panelists who might have um, answers right. there. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. William or somebody else? I would say my I one of CS course, and then you do assignments, there's some coding. So uh, if a lot of people submit similar work, looks really similar, certain writing style, then that raises some flags. And of course, you can always put the prompt in or try to answer the assignment using that to the end and cross check that. So that's, I guess, all of it. But in terms of these AI detectors, not really, but I guess someone from English would have to speak to that. Just a question where you mentioned cross check, cross check with what? You put the prompt in, like you, you try to act as the student, you see what ChatGPT would give and then compare that to student submissions. This, and if you get a lot of student submissions that look the same, then yeah. and 
also, if you encourage students to cite their sources, then maybe you'll get one student who actually cited, I used chat to be here, and you can see students who didn't. Yeah. Okay, thank you, William. Uh, anybody else has some, uh, if um, uh, uh, in, in your context? Yeah, I, I think that um, actually in, in the humanities at the moment is pretty, you know, they are frequently using professors um, AI detection it's there is a section of Turnitin that has AI detection. How well it works, that's a different question, but professors are looking at it. I'm pretty sure that it is integrated into Turnitin at the moment. And I think students can even see their own mark on AI detection. I think if you put it in and you look at your, uh, uh, your canvas, you can actually see what it pops up because obviously instructors want you to know if you're plagiarizing or not. Um, so yeah, I definitely think that it is, it is a practice, but obviously instructors have to take it with a grain of salt because how reliable they are is definitely a, a question we have to ask ourselves. Right, and I'm trying to follow the chat, but um, so so right now at UBC, we're not you know encouraging the use of any uh, uh, Gen AI detectors uh, for various reasons, for ethical reasons in particular. For people like me with an accent that may just be uh, uh, the uh, a victim of 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 those uh, different tools, so there's no uh, no um, no position regarding the actual use of uh, of detectors. But that, there's a position, and actually, it's on the academic integrity website. There's an FAQ section that speaks specifically to uh, the, the the use of detectors. So my next question is really about uh, privacy considerations. Um, so what are your privacy concerns when it comes to generative AI? How do you deal with this as a student in terms of biases, ethical implications? Uh, how should the university community deal with this? Um, and Jacqueline, would you like to take this one on? Sure. So um, for privacy concerns regarding the use of Gen AI, so basically I have two. So the first one is about sharing of personal information. So uh, when accessing all these Gen AI tools, so basically users, they have to share the personal information in exchange for the service. So take ChatGPT as an example. When I was uh, doing the registration, I'm using my Google account and also my mobile phone number. So technically I'm giving in two pieces of my personal information information. And personally, I don't feel so comfortable sharing both my email and phone number to the tool, but I couldn't do anything because that, uh, that um, I mean, it was the only choice. So the step that I took to kind of better protect myself is to use an email account that I don't use, normally use it for my personal and also professional communication so that my ChatGPT account is not like linked to the email account that I'm always using. And um, there's another incident that uh, I did have a conversation with some of my classmates in class um, talking about like the use of ChatGPT. And then I realized some of them, they haven't tried ChatGPT ChatGPT at all until this moment, which was quite surprising to me. So when I was asking like, oh, why didn't you try it? And then their response um, was like, um, some of them are actually hesitant to try Gen AI tools because they are uncomfortable sharing their personal phone number with the tool. So I guess uh, this leads to the discussion of equity um, to this um, uh, the use of these tools. So I think uh, for this concern, what the university community could do is to make sure that if ChatGPT or other Gen AI tools are used or encouraged to be used in some courses, like um, uh, Gabrielle's case, then uh, I think like um, the instructors should um, ensure all students have equal access to these tools without uh, being asked or forced to give in their personal information for the service. So um, that is uh, one thing that I think the university community can do. And my second privacy concern is about how my data would be used. And uh, I think some of, uh, some of um, the, um, I saw some questions on the Padlet addressing this as well. So technically uh, when I, 
read ChatGPT's uh, use of content. So the word content in ChatGPT is, uh, is, defi uh, is defined as the input of the user and the output of the tool. So basically ChatGPT clearly states that they may use the content to provide, maintain, develop, and improve their services. So um, although like there's another line saying that users can opt out if they don't want ChatGPT to use their content to train their models, but it also means that in some cases, the ability of ChatGPT may be limited. So I guess this has some um, ethical implications. And uh, as a graduate student, I respect copyright and also academic integrity, like what we've discussed earlier. So I personally, I wouldn't input lecture notes or any research papers into the tool because I do not have the permission from the author or the creator or the instructor to share the work with ChatGBT. So, um, um, and also like, I think there's uh, one question since I'm mainly using ChatGPT for proofreading for my work. So um, actually I don't feel so comfortable like having all my paper like input into ChatGPT because um, that is like, um, like exposing myself too much to the tool. So basically what I do is um, usually if I'm um, working on a specific topic, there are like names uh, or any like identifiers. I would just like um, leave it as like a blank, put in a bracket and say name or like just put XXX, just not to share too much information with ChatGPT. And uh, also um, because I think that even though like ChatGPT has um, the term saying that, oh, they're going to um, delete, uh, I mean, if you delete things on ChatGPT, it would be deleted like um, within 30 days, but I'm not very confident or I, um, I'm not trusting that much. So uh, I guess uh, these are like my privacy concerns and what the university community can do more is uh, like uh, what William mentioned earlier, that is to provide clearer guidelines on when it is appropriate to use Gen AI tools. So it's not just about like, oh, you can use it on this assignment, but like saying like, can you like, share the course notes with ChatGPT or even like can you um like how like how much I could be using it. Um so uh or another thing is like having more guides or maybe workshops to offer like um students and allow them to understand more about like what are some privacy concerns and ethical implication of using these tools. Thank you Jacqueline for this very uh, comprehensive answer. Um, and I can say uh the digital tattoo program train you well. <laughs> um, Manzura? Uh, yeah, so I'll continue. I think one, it's similar to what Jacqueline was touching upon, but for humanities, we have like, for me personally, uh, beside the personal data that Jacqueline explained very well, there is a problem with the, the data or sensitivity of the information, especially if you're doing with research that has uh, participants. So, we um we're dealing, for example, recently I'm dealing with an anthropological research where we do interview people, and it's very strictly we have a, like more than five six pages of the data policy on how we're not allowed to use any content of even just written or any reference from the interview uh with the participants in the AI model, even if we're just to generate response or hypothesis or anything because it's very it's a very sensitive matter. Now. For, for some programs or let's say some topics like let's say literature or something that is very much established facts or not facts, I mean available widely, it might be easier to use chat GPT just like as brainstorming or a prompt or this type of things. But when you are dealing with human-based um or personalized data, it's gonna it's going to become a very problematic nature and we are like prohibited to use that. The other problem is that there is also the bias that comes with the answers that comes up with the AI. And it, this includes when you're dealing with some political questions, some religious questions that could generate responses that might not be correct. And you might not have the capacity, especially if, as a student, might I might not have the capacity to evaluate it. It is a very specific question regarding political stand or religious stand. And that might cause a problem. It's, it's kind of similar to the hallucination problem, but in this case, I might not detect it and I might build a whole research or anything that would be based on a wrong bias data or bias assumption. So in both cases, these are the main problems with generative AI. Uh, how should the university deal with this? I mean, for at least I know for the privacy part, it's 
each program has their own specific way to deal with it. And sometimes within the program, each course or instructor have their own way. For my research, I know that the, there are like the same department has more than five, six profs doing their own research and they all have different models on how to deal with the what items are allowed, not allowed. And another way I'm hearing, I'm not sure if it has been applied to UBC, but some universities are trying to do their own like AI softwares inside the university. So that will like limit the problem of data leaking outside. But I'm not sure if UBC has done something at this point regarding that or not. Thank you, Manzura. Um, does anybody else wants to uh, respond to that question or add add anything to this? I'll add on to that just because I saw a question on the Padlet. It was about providing equity for AI tools since they haven't passed the PIA. And then how can we give like equal access to these AI tools? And really, I guess the answer would be what Menzer mentioned with these universities who have their own AI software that everyone has access to. But also that way you keep your data protected inside a university. And I guess that would be the way moving forward or you have some sort of partnership to, so everyone has access and then data remains in Canada. That's a big wish, William. <laughs> um, Gabriel or Elena? Yeah, um, if I can address uh, some of the uh, data concerns, um, especially just going off what uh, Jacqueline has said, um, I would also agree with Jacqueline not to trust um, most AI tools, um, not speaking about ChatGPT, but mostly um, some of the AI tools that we looked at uh, were specifically to uh, help students with Canvas quizzes. And so most of those tools, when reviewing the terms and conditions, they did say, yes, we will use your information responsibly, but we are also in partnership with this corporation, that corporation, and your information can be distributed with them as needed for marketing purposes or whatnot. And so I think there's a lack of awareness uh, in um, for students um, in how their information is used because most of the time, if a student is already looking for these types of tools, they're not thinking anymore about their information. They're thinking already about their grades or even like, yeah, it's mostly about their grades. So I think, putting um, that into the guidelines and warning students as well um, would not also help them protect um, their information, but also um, it would also discourage them from academic misconduct um, as well. So that's what I'll add here. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Elena, anything? No, I think, I think everyone covered uh, this topic very well, quite well. Okay. Thank you so much. So I've got my next question about the value and reliability of, of, of the outputs that GenAI uh, uh, provides. Uh, we've got a few questions on the, on the Padlet already, so I'll make sure that we address those questions for this particular uh, topic. Um, so with the, the rise of AI uh, that can complete assignments on any, any subject, any topic, what do you believe is the real value of your education? Uh, Elena? Awesome. I love this question. Um, obviously, I'm now on my second master's degree. I, I mentioned that in the chat. So I love education. I'm here for it. It's a passion of mine. Um, but I find value in my education because I put forth the work of learning what it is that I'm actually interested in learning. Um, and so I think if you're here at school to get a credential, to get a degree, to not really learn, you know, sometimes there are people like that and that's okay. Um, AI is just a tool that they can leverage to kind of push through to the end. Um, and how do we get beyond that? I think it comes down to assessments. Uh, will education continue to provide, provide value if we do not change our assessments to align with the changes and development of AI? Probably not. <laughs> There's not enough value in education if we don't adapt, right, and, and change. And so I think what we're going to be seeing over the next few years is uh, a change in assessments to encourage creativity, to encourage critical thinking, to see how students actually apply their work in versatile and different ways rather than maybe regurgitating something. Um, and so whether that, whether the value changes, I think is dependent on how we adapt, how we move forward, and then also how we continue to inspire students and 
um, give a reason, give them a reason to want to be here as well, right? To be in the educational space. So just a quick follow-up question, because you mentioned, you know, we need to adapt, we need to change. On the other hand, what would you like to preserve? That's a really good question. Um, a really good way of, a really good example is perhaps um, instead of asking students to regurgitate summaries, for instance, like write a summary about this, um, ask them to apply the information that they have learned with maybe a critical concept and then their own experience. ChatGBT cannot make up their own experience. <laughs> you cannot look at a person's paper and think, ah, oh, yes, they've experienced this hardship or so on and so forth. Like ChatGBT ChatGBT at this point in time, at this point in time, cannot make that up. Um, or perhaps it's a it's a creative output that involves some kind of um, unique assembly of different tools, right? That actually demands that students actually apply these kind of interdisciplinary ideas. Um, I think the the method of assessment will change between each field and each industry um, for writing and you know, digital humanities, the field that I'm particularly interested in, I think it's going to come down to their knowledge on the topic. Like a graduate student needs to be well-researched. They need to be well-educated in the topic that they're talking about. Chad GBT does not know as much as I do on Victorian literature, and that is evident. And that is evident to the instructors that are also grading their work. So um, yeah, dependent, dependent on the field, but adaptation is really an underlying, the underlying uh, motivator here. <laughs> I hope that answered the question. It does. Thank you very much. Um, Jacqueline? Yeah, so adding up to Helena's uh, point, so actually I'm pursuing my second master's degree too. So I'm super into education. I love learning. So I want to extend a little bit on like the critical thinking part. So yeah, I mean like, yes, AI tools, um, they can, probably can complete a lot of tasks such as like brainstorming or summarizing and they might be able to do it better than humans. However, like a graduate student, like to me, um, the purpose of education or like going to school is not just to complete academic tasks. So I do still see the value of education and I think the real value of education is to acquire skills, to think creatively and also critically. And um, like um, one thing that uh, just like Helena mentioned that like uh, those tools, they, um, they, there are like limitations. Like for example, at least for now, um, like uh, ChatGPT or other AI tools, they um, kind of lack the ability to verify credibility and reliability of information. So the cr critical thinking skills that I acquire throughout my education journey um, can help me um, like understand the benefits and also the challenges of using these tools. And also um, like uh, my education, actually it helps um, me to make informed decisions when I'm using these tools. So this is how I see the value of my education and the relationship with using AI tools. Thank you, Jacqueline. So we have a question in, in, uh, in Padlet that it's somehow related to this, um, and I leave anybody to take this one on. So the idea of professor grading your work using AI, what's your gut reaction to this idea and what's your hope and concern? Who would like to answer this one? Uh, I can get the ball rolling. Um, my gut reaction, I mean, I don't think anybody really likes it when some kind of external source is assessing their work, regardless of of whether or not you you know did cheat using ChatGPT or whether or not you didn't. I think it's still a little uncomfy knowing that there is an external tool that is reviewing your work and then assessing it and then providing some kind of like data metrics on it that might impact your grade or your outcome. Um, so my gut, it's always a little icky. It was a little icky with Turnitin to begin with, um, and that's been around for years now. Um, I beyond that, more critically, I think, I think that at the moment, these AI detection tools are not strong. From the information that I have gathered on my own research, I have detected that the uh, AI tools are, are 
they don't they don't function the way that we hope they would um and they, there is no real concrete way for instructors to really be able to assess if a student is using ai i think it's on the basis of understanding a student's learning process their tone their knowledge how they function before have they written pieces that are similar um, have they demonstrated that they've been developing those skills that they were demonstrating quite well in this particular assignment um, that might have flagged for ai um, so i think you have to take it for a grain of salt and i know that somebody else has possibly mentioned that these tools do uh do inherently uh, are biased towards people of second language speakers or second language speakers because of the syntax that it particularly looks at um, when trying to assess the, like AI detection. So I don't know. It's one of those things where it might be more cause it might be causing more confusion than good. <laughs> and you always have to take it with a grain of salt. And anytime we have to take anything with a grain of salt, there's just so much more thinking and critical thinking involved. And sometimes for instructors, that is a lot to have to be always cognizant of. Thank you, Elena. And I, I was, I was kind of also interested more into the, the the use of AI to grade, not necessarily to detect. Because um, if if you look on the academic integrity website at UBC, you know we we discourage instructors of using any any of those tools and you know Turnitin in particular. So let's say you know the prof don't have the ability of verifying you know if whether or not the output has been uh, generated by some ai but the idea of you being graded by um by ai so how would you feel about this yeah i'll give my opinion on this one so i mean if you're just grading it put it in you're not even looking at the assignments then that's bad don't do that but let's say you're actually using it to help you so you're actually looking over what it's graded in my courses at least i don't even get feedback anyways it's just a rubric correct, correct, wrong, 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 and then you just check the answer key. So there's no feedback anyways. But if you have an AI tool, maybe with that, you can start giving better feedback. It's like, hey, this is where I saw you went just wrong, this way you could have done better. Then great, because that wasn't there before. So if it allows you to actually give better feedback instead of just you know grading, then I'm all for it, as long as you're still actually checking the output. Thanks, William. And why don't you have currently any feedback? Is that like the way it is designed, the rubric, or is just uh, yeah? You just you think? at least in math and CS, you just get it right or you get it wrong. You just on Canvas, you get the grade, and then some of the courses post an answer key, so you just look at the answer key or hey, go to office hours because we can't post the solutions. So, okay. thank you, um, Gabriel, maybe or Manzura. I was just going to follow up with uh, William's one because this is interesting that on the idea, uh, the contrary in the humanities, uh, like we are encouraged to give feedback as a way of like going beyond the idea of just normal rubric based, like just uh, marking because, you know, humanities is mostly about what, where it went wrong or answer or what you did well or not do well. So um, I can't speak of everyone in the department, but I know that at least a good number of our profs and including the prof I'm studying with and, and teaching with, all of them have this policy that no AI grading at all, at least in our department. And this and part of this is also that every single assignment we do, like as a TA we have to do, it'll have to be handed back with very specific personalized feedback, even just one, two sentence that shows that you as instructor has interacted with, with the answer. So this is one way of breaking the idea of maybe it was graded by AI. So this is very much contrary to maybe the other disciplines like that has the opposite. The feedback is coming from the AI, which is not the case for us. Thank you very much. Anything else from anybody? We sometimes have like provocative questions on, on the Padlet. So I'm, I'm making sure that, you know, I get those questions to kind of push you a little bit. No other comments on this one? All right, so now let's talk about the benefits and challenges. Um, so to you, what are some of the benefits and challenges of using Gen AI in your learning? So you've mentioned a few already. Um, how do you evaluate the quality and reliability of Gen AI outputs in your learning? And I'm referring to this, uh, to this info saying, you know, we always assume Gen AI is like 100% confident 
but only 70% accurate. So keeping this in mind, um, and what is Gen AI to you? Is that a tutor, a coach, trainer? Uh, Gabriel also already mentioned, like he's kind of a study buddy, but I'm interested in this sort of uh, question as well. So we have three components to that question. So I will let maybe William, Jacqueline, Manzura, Gabriel to take that on. I can go first. Um, I almost think of chat, like not chat GPT, just chat GPT, but generative AI is more of a classmate than as an instructor or tutor, because, uh, you know, when you discuss your ideas with the classmate, they might give you some new ways to deal with the Christian problems at all, but you don't really trust your trust classmate as the way you'll trust or like believe in the information given by the instructor. So take it with the way that this is a new way to approach and then continue based on that. So for me, as the benefits I face with generative AI, it really helps to shape your thoughts when you need to say it out loud and come up with some ideas that you might not have always the access to have someone to listen to your rant and come up with ideas. So I keep just striking the prompt after prompt until I, okay, this is what I was looking for. This sounds much better. I will start working from this point. But the challenges is that AI cannot really deal other than very superficial information. So if I'm looking for something very specific in my field, it will often not understand, will give me some very shallow answers. And then I'll have to say, I might do it by myself alone. It's not going there. Like very simple example, if I give something which was colonial, it might give me some very normal answers. But then when I look specifically on, for example, trauma and post-colonial, then they will not be able to answer that. Because again, their access to information is very really limited. And of course, they're just generating. So this is both a benefit challenge in a way. And to uh, evaluate the quality, one of the things I always do, go back to the resources they're mentioning. It hallucinates a lot. It doesn't know how to say, I don't know. It will just keep generating answers, keep quoting from people that do not exist at all. So even if you take an idea and you find interesting, I always go to UBC library and other sources to make sure that this thing actually exists. And there are oftentimes you'll be surprised they're misrepresenting or misinterpreting some of the famous quotes and then putting it in a very different way. That is again, very problematic. And that's why I was saying there is a bias in how they they might quote someone who is very much opposite stand to prove their point that is on a very different matter. So now this is also part of the reason why AI grading is not integrated in some sort of humanities because we humanities evaluate how much you're arguing with your point, whether right or wrong. So we don't really have right and wrong, but more like, do you argue, is your argument making sense to me, whether I agree with that or not? So AI, of course, cannot do that. AI will just go and fact check with what they have available. So no, this is not, this is wrong. So that is in my, like in a way, in the summary, what I would say in AI, it's a classmate, think with it, but don't trust it completely. So, if, if I may, Manzura, so let's, you know, we're talking about today, you know, Gen AI is a few months old, which is quite a, quite kind of scary when you think about this. It's just so recent and, and yet we, we talk about it so much. If I ask you the same question in five years or 10 years from now, would you have the same answer regarding the uh, the reliability of, of those tools? And if they were to improve dramatically, what, would you have the same answer? I think what will improve with it also are our critical thinking abilities. Like part of the part of the questions we are questioning now in the STS and humanity studies, including also science and technology, is that it's a it's the like long question of trust, truth, and post-truth and these type of ideas. But we are evolving with the new technologies. So in the next five, 10 years, of course, the AI will change completely and my user of it will probably change, but also the way I will I will verify the facts, I will take the facts, will change. So I think the notion of what is right and wrong or more like what is trustable or not will change at that time too. It's really evolving very fastly. And maybe right now we're seeing it as a crisis because AI is evolving way faster than we are evolving. But but I have noticed that there is also a change in how teaching methods has changed. We are, we are moved past the fact that teaching as learning to the fact that teaching as critical thinking in a in way. So we'll probably see that change too coming up with that. So yeah, my position will change, but also my way of thinking or dealing with that will change too. Thank you, Manzur. Uh William, Jacqueline, Gabriel, who wants to take this one? I can go first. <laughs> so yeah, um, I I think like Mr. made a really good point about AI, and then uh, for me, like uh, what 
Jenny I to me is kind of more like a friend or maybe an assistant to some quick fix of like simple questions but not well researched ones because like like what we have been talking about like how like hallucination or like um, misinformation might be generated by AI. So um, I think the benefits of using Gen AI in my learning is that I think I work I work more efficiently uh, since I'm using it for like mainly for proof reading and then brainstorming and then now I can do it in a really timely manner and then just uh, build on something based on like some inspiration that I uh, got from the tool and how I am like evaluate the quality and reliability of Gen AI outputs is that I always check the output before uh, I use them as part of my work, especially when I see numbers or specific examples. So one um, incident that I can share is that uh, I once asked ChatGPT uh, about how many public libraries uh, there are in Canada. And then it gave me a number, a specific number, saying that according to a 2019 report, there are like, um, like how many libraries are there, public libraries are there in Canada? And then I then I, I always ask a follow-up question. And then I was like, what's the name of the report? Can you tell me? And then uh, the reply from ChatGPT was interesting. It says, I don't have the link to the exact report, but you um, but you can go find statistics on a website. So that moment I know that, okay, so um, it might not be um, accurate, that number. So I know that um, I need to do my own research. I cannot rely on that. So that is like how uh, one way that I evaluate the output that is like, I always ask follow-up questions to make sure that is true or at least close to the truth. And um, also I would say like uh, for Gen AI output that uh, as a library school student, I really see like how um, these tools might be um, providing like um, not very accurate information to students since I've been staffing library chat reference services. And then uh, we have uh, received queries from students uh, asking about like, oh, can you help uh, me look uh, for a resource that is uh, something. And then when we try uh, help uh, with this issue, so uh, we found that um, it's not existing. And then when we follow up with students and then the student was like, oh, it, uh, it's actually suggested by ChatGPT. So um, basically uh, in this case, we can know that, oh, ChatGPT actually made up something. So it's like what Mansura said, ChatGPT, um, it just like, um, I try to like answer all of your questions, but not saying I do not know something. So I think it's really important to like uh, students, um, we use it uh, when we are using it, we should be like um, paying attention to the quality and also the rea reliability of the outputs. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, William or Gabriel, from your perspective uh, as a student using uh, Gen AI. Yeah, so for me, Gen AI is a tutor that's personalized, available 24-7. So for the benefits and challenges of using Gen AI in learning, at least for learning, if I had to say the number one predictor of how well a student will succeed in your course or how well they'll learn the material, it just comes down to effort. So these are the benefits and challenges of generative AI. If using generative AI in a way leads to higher effort, maybe because of the time efficiency or the personalization, students are putting more effort in, then I think that's beneficial. But if you're using generative AI in a way to not learn, to just take the answers, not think critically, you're putting in less effort, then that's a detriment. So in terms of evaluating quality and reliability, this is where you actually need to know what you're doing. So this also goes into like the previous slide about the value of, of our education. I personally believe our education is more important than ever because you can fall into two camps. You either know what generative AI is saying and you can actually evaluate the outputs or you don't. So then you just have to take it at face value. You put in an output and then generative AI gives you an answer. You, don't, you can't think critically enough to evaluate whether it's a good enough output. And then that's when we're in trouble. So I believe education is more important than ever just because you need to be able to evaluate these outputs. And if you can't, then that's not something, something you should do. But if you don't know any better, then that's the only choice you have pretty much. So the best way to evaluate is just to look at the output it gives. And then if it's giving examples, for example, you can actually cross check it. If it's giving code, well, you can run the code. And if you know what you're doing, then you can tell immediately if the code is good. 
if it's doing math, say multiply a three by three matrix for me, you can look at the steps it gives, like say, hey, give me the steps you took to give this output. And then you can cross check those steps. And oftentimes it's, it's wrong, but I kind of like that because then it's less tempting to use standard AI. It's just so tempting right now because you know we're students, there's so many courses, so little time. If I use standard AI right here, maybe I'll save some time. I could just, I could just get the answer. But then I think that's detrimental to learning because lower effort, but it's just so tempting. When generative AI gets better, then that attempt would be even harder to resist, I, I feel. Yeah. So William, I don't know if we answered that question in the Padlet, but uh, because you, you share the strategies that you know you use to kind of uh, cross-check the, the information, the example that you know uh, the Gen AI has produced. Um, can you estimate how much time it costs you to verify this? Because you say, you know, the, the value for this would be, you know, if students spend more time for their learning using those those tools, then it's it's beneficial. Um, but uh, in your experience, like how much more time have you spent doing this sort of cross-check of, of the output generated by AI? Yeah, I would consider myself to, I, I actually put the effort in to learn the material so I can pretty quickly tell if it's right or it's wrong. But that's also based on the way I'm using it. If I was using more of like immediate source where I wasn't, I didn't put the effort into, I wasn't trying to answer a question. I didn't really put minutes into the question and it just put it straight into chat to P, then I don't think I would be able to quickly evaluate it. But since I already put the time in and the effort, then it's pretty quick. It's, it's a couple of seconds and yeah, it's not too much effort. Okay. And so let's say, you know, you need to do further exploration. Would you be using a different AI, completely different AI that may function a little bit differently? Uh, would that be something that you would consider doing? No, I, I would think for myself first, because again, I want to think critically and then be better than the AI in certain things. I don't want to be like a person where like I'm not good enough or Jennifer can surpass me. That's like my fear. So I need to be able to think critically and then put the effort into my, my, like myself before I check with generative AI. And then that way I can actually learn something. And maybe a different question, <laughs> just out of curiosity. Let's say you talk to your classmates and they say, oh, you know, I've used this different system and I think I, I get much better response. I assume, you know, you would be exploring that different system or different tool based on what your classmates would say. I mean, as a CS student, I'm always interested in seeing the latest and greatest technologies. Like I have GPT-4, I played around the GPT-4 API. So I, technically I do have the best of the model. So if they did say, hey, I tried this and this works great, like I would try it. Like, hey, I tried to generate some study questions. Like, okay, and it worked well for them. I'll, I'll try it for myself. But in terms of strong AI, then I already have the strongest. So I, I can't answer that. All right, thanks. Um, Gabriel, are you able to... Uh provide some uh, insight on that question. Yes, of course. Um, can you guys hear, hear me well? Okay, Very good. Um, thank you. Sorry, I just had some technical difficulties a while ago, but I think um, on top of the um, amazing answers that the other panelists has already given, I can speak from my own experience that um, I would say um, AI is only, or Gen AI is only beneficial only if you know how it works. And it really depends on your level of mastery of the uh, subject matter. So um, what does this mean? Um, so just from um, the example that I provided um, earlier in our introduction, uh, when our professor actually provided a, re a really terrible research paper, um, what um, just to go deeper into details, um, for those um, um, who are uh, more familiar, um, in um, evaluating scientific research papers, um, p-values that are less than 0 0.05, um, that just means that the findings that they saw were insignificant. However, when using Humata AI, what ended up happening was that Humata, Humata AI actually just summarized um, the talking points um, for the future. So there's a discussion section in the research paper that discusses moving forward with these findings, what, what does it say? What does it mean to our field? And so that was clearly a misinterpretation. 
um, any good professor and any good student would know that this re research paper should not be trusted. However, um, just like one of our panelists brought up, um, most of AI doesn't say what they don't know. It always tries to answer your question. And so it did lead to actually wrong answers. And so um, for students who had lower level of mastery in the course or um, in terms of reading research papers, um, which unfortunately were my friends, uh, <laughs> some of my friends, uh, they actually believed in um, AI 100% instead of evaluating its accuracy and ended up getting um, their grades deducted because they put in the wrong answers. Um, but also what was really useful in this class was that before we went into like um, dive deeper into research papers, what our professor did is actually, she taught us how to read research papers, what to look out for, um, how to read the discussion and how to um, evaluate uh, critically what even the authors were saying. And so in doing such as well, because our professor also encouraged the use of um, the Humata AI, um, we um, were taught how to critically evaluate um, its responses. And so adjust from that as well, using our knowledge on how to interpret research papers and also our base knowledge in like cognitive neuroscience, we were able to um, like use it as a tool, um, as a helpful tool uh, rather than um, something uh, that um, might be harmful for us. So if I were to make an analogy, um, AI can is like a kitchen knife. Um, if you give it to a chef, they will know how to use it. They can cook you like this amazing dish but if you give it to a three-year-old, they, well, they might be able to cook up something, but they can also hurt themselves um, when using it. So yeah, that's where I will leave um, my answer for this question. Thank you, Gabriel. I have a, a few more questions in the, in the Padlet, so I'll make sure we, uh, we allocate some time to discuss those. <laughs> As Lucas mentioned, we love the, the kitchen knife analogy. I would think more of a Swiss knife, but that's not exactly the, the same reference you're making here. Uh, there, there was actually a question about the study buddy that you, you just referred to uh, a little bit earlier. Um, and what differences do the students think they are in using AI compared to asking the, let's say, an in-person resource uh, that might be available on campus or even a TA? So now, now that you have Gen AI that is available, uh, to help you out as a study buddy. So do you think there's a change in uh, in your behavior in, in, in the way you may be asking for help or, or more? Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I think I can speak to that. Um, I think for students who don't know how to use it, again, um, who don't have the that sufficient level of mastery, it will definitely take away from them um, the need or want to go to the instructor or the TA instead of asking, at least from my own experiences observing um, the friends around me. Um, however, for those who do know how to use it and who are taught how to use it, they will actually go to the TAs even more to verify um, what the output is. And so I think um, when it comes to, if you want to still encourage students and which I would also like to see happen in the UBC community as well, is really to um, make the students aware of what AI can do and what it cannot do. And in doing so, it would encourage them to come to the TA and say, hey, um, I use AI, I got this answer, is this correct? Or go to the professor, did the AI misinterpret something? Is this a hallucination? Because um, I think one thing that we can shine the light to students is that um, we may not know enough to evaluate the output that AI gives us. And in doing so, that will um, foster even, uh, I would say, better um, like interaction between professors and students and might even encourage students to come to office hours or TAs um, even more often. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers the question. Sure. Thank you. So that's a good point that you're making about, you know, that may um, 
foster the interaction between the instructor and the students. So I would say in the in the context of a of a prof allowing the use of Gen AI, but if let's say an instructor is you know is not allowing you to use the Gen AI, but you know you still have question based on the use of Gen AI like that, I would be curious to see the the reaction of the prof saying, "Well, you're not supposed to," and uh, because what William and you were also saying is that you know as, as long as it's beneficial to the learning experience, that you know you you invest more time in in looking for the right response or. That's that's what it's supposed to be. So I would be curious to see that relationship based on you know whether or not you're allowed or not. And uh, it's just a, a reflection of my own. Um, and I've got a, one more question. If I don't say anything wrong, and that might be the the, the last one. So about originality in learning. So as you know, Gen AI becomes more sophisticated, and it will become a lot more sophisticated. Uh, does original work still exist for students? Or do you think we are witnessing the end of uh, authenticity uh, authenticity in uh, in academia? Uh, Elena and Manzura, what do you have to say about this? Um, so uh, I, like, I like that original work is in quotes because what really is original work? AI uses information and words off of the internet that people have already said people have put this information into the ether already it has come from somewhere ai is not making anything up it's not creating new ideas doing new research or composing new theories it's just taking information that has already existed and compiling it in a way that makes sense to us um, so does original work still exist? Of course it does, because we have to continue to do more research. We have to continue to have more creative outputs. Um, we have to find ways to connect our personal uh, experiences to the information that we're producing. Um, uh, because, you know, the author is almost as important as the work that they produce. Uh, you can't you can't separate both from from either. You know, we want to share our personal experiences. We want to add um, about the the lives that we we have in this world to the work that we're actually producing and so that's what makes it original it's our experiences it's the way that we view the world the perspective the tone the way that our experiences have shaped the way that we think about particular things that you know topics political ideas um, that AI might view as objective quote-unquote so yes it does original uh, originality does still exist and will continue to exist but like i said academia needs to keep up we have to be asking for students to be original if you are asking students to regurgitate the same thing that a gazillion of other students have also said is it really that original are we asking students to think critically if we're asking them to do something that a million of other people have also done yes we need foundational skills we need foundational knowledge but there's also an extent to to that as well so that's my two cents i think it's a bit bit of twofold we need uh it will continue to exist but we need to ask people to be original we need to ask them to think critically and to put forth that effort thank you Elena. that i can see the passion i can feel the passion in your response when 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 you answer uh manzula actually this question has driven in my english department profs having different approaches to the ai in their class so for some profs, the the originality counts in the way you're producing the idea. It's not just how you're writing it, but also the idea it's creation itself is an original work. But for some other profs, it has the idea that there is no problem using AI to brainstorm to create ideas and then extend on that because there is no such, such thing as that very original idea. Whether you're using it with AI or using your own research, uh, you are actually taking inspiration from other works, building up on other works. So an AI, and I'm quoting an ideal AI that could actually, let's say, give you a very real information, should be able to just keep summarizing or um, shortening the length, the time that would have taken you to go through books and research uh, works and build on that. So this is very strong point. What do you think? For some people, there is no such thing as an original idea to work to begin with, and it's every work is an extension for the previous one. And AI is just one of the steps that you will take and continue building up on that. For other people, know the idea of where you originating your idea from is the question of original. So using AI takes away this originality, even if you're adding to that. I I can't really say what I stand as a student because 
it really depends upon where to go. But all I can say for sure for most people that using AI only for sure is not an original work. It really depends on what you're going with that. But whether to use AI at the beginning of the work, that is the question here. And that I think each has their own view on that. Thank you, Mazura. So we're getting to the almost to the end. So I just want to make sure you know we uh, we address the questions that we have in the Padlet. We we've addressed a few already. Uh, there are a, a, a few more, uh, and I've been following up the chat. And thank you to Lucas, uh, uh, Richard as well to to uh, chime in and answer. Um, I've seen responses also from um, Stephen as well. So thank you, Stephen. Uh, so do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share based on the conversations we've had all together today uh, regarding the use of uh, Gen AI? So I'll let you, uh, I'll let anybody to uh, to answer here or respond. Uh, I'll just say a small point here is that generative AI is very new and it seems hard to think about like how does generative AI impact this? How does this change this? And I feel like if we just remove the generative AI part from the statement, then we can try to draw on our existing knowledge of how the, the like we have a lot of knowledge built up throughout the years throughout teaching. So say the question is, how does generative AI, like why would students use generative AI to cheat in my course? Well, then remove generative AI and ask the question, how, like why would students cheat in your course? And then you can start applying all the knowledge you already know. And then I think that this simplifies the process or if you can draw a comparison and then compare that with, how generative AI is different or similar, then you can start getting um, a good like foothold of how to think further and evaluate generative AI and how it changes things. Thank you, William. And, and maybe just uh, based on what you, what you just answered. So um, how do you think we, 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 we should do or the profs should do to kind of create an experience um, so that the students will learn and develop skills, you know, with the use of Gen AI, because this is not going to go anywhere. We have only a few months of experience with those, but in five or 10 years from now, they will, you know, they will be quite different. Um, so what kind of experience, you know, would you like to see as a student in, 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 the, in, in your, in your courses, uh, in the future? So then students are being, uh, used to using, uh, Gen AI, develop new skills for researching or for, for reflecting on content, being more critical. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I would say in general, if you try to implement things that lead to higher effort, so generative AI, make it more interesting because again, why would students put more effort into your course? If your course content is interesting or it's easy to get into, then students are more likely to put higher effort into your course and engage more. And say, let's say you're designing an assignment. If all your questions are ridiculously difficult, then, well, you don't leave many options. However, if you start the assignment with like some easy questions, some fundamental ones that give a strong foundation, then this would be the time where they can use generative AI to like check their learning, use it on these like throwaway questions. And then when you get to the actually interesting questions, then they have the foundation. They don't need to use generative AI at that point, or they don't need to just like cheat and get the answer. So if you make your assignments and your course content like digestible and you build up, then you can kind of like encourage and discourage the use, use of generative AI. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, Elena? Oh, I can, I can add on to that. Um, you know, this, we talked, we talked a lot about critical thinking skills throughout this uh, panel and that it's really important to have critical thinking skills to use generative AI, but you really need to gain the critical thinking skills from actually working through problems and assessing and really not copying out and, you know, just putting in answers or getting answers from uh, alternative sources, generative AI or not. Um, and I think what instructors really have to do now more than ever is convince students that the skills they are gaining in their class will serve them uh, intrinsically as a person in this world, rather than someone who's just trying to get a degree. Um, because we, we do need critical thinking skills to move through this world, to have conversations with our loved ones, with our partners, to understand political topics, to understand the ways in which the structures that 
uh, change how we live uh, actually implicate, you know, our, our decisions and our lives. And so we do need critical thinking skills and knowledge for life, life broadly. And I think instructors now more than ever, unfortunately, really have to market that to students and give them a reason why. Why do you need these skills? Why do you need to think about these skills outside of the context of these walls, of these walls of this classroom? Why is this knowledge valuable for you to actually know as you move through this life? Because four years of undergrad, whatever, postgrad, that's maybe what, seven years? Seven years is a fraction of the time that you will spend on this earth and you will need these skills. And you know, we, we're just kind of losing that. Um, that kind of passion, I think, or or not necessarily passion, but reasoning and rationale, because now we have to be much more critical of the why. Why do we need this? Now students have to be really propelling themselves and, uh, you know, asking themselves to be critical. And so maybe even implementing more real world implications or, or asking students to engage with these ideas on a more intimate level so that students feel connected and feel motivated to continue their studies in a way that doesn't revolve around cheating or <laughs> copping out because it's too difficult because they actually want to learn. They actually want to be here. Yeah. Thank you, Elena. But that, that's, that's a good point. I think it's interesting because we have only a few months of experience, I guess, and we are more into this mode of reaction in terms, instead of being, you know, anticipating what we should be doing. And I, I guess time will tell, you know, in terms of skills that would be needed in a, in a particular domain or discipline, you know, once someone graduates. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, what comes out from this in the next five or 10 years, or seven years, as you mentioned. Um, we have a question from Christina in, in the chat that I'd like to ask you guys. Um, if an instructor an instructor suspects the students use Gen AI in a way that is not allowed for their course, how do you think they should best address this with the students? So that's kind of back to what Gabriel was saying, the sort of the interaction with the prof, fostering the interaction, the collaboration, sort of, you know, asking for questions. But in the case the prof is not necessarily allowing or allowing the, such a use of Gen AI. So um, who would like to respond to that question? from uh, Christina. Yeah, one of my courses, they suspect people have used Gen of AI. They had a slide beginning of the class. They said, okay, this person cited, this person did not. We suspect them of using Gen of AI. Next time you get zero, but this time it's okay. And you basically just scared everyone into using it. So I'm assuming that you allow citation, but if you just ban ChatGPT or Gen of AI, then, well, you kind of put it on yourself to start policing things. So. If it's citation, then that's an option you can try. But if it's just banning, then yeah, it's making it harder on yourself. Let's say hypothetically you have a course and then the syllabus is a final exam worth 100% of the grade. Then technically, everyone quickly realizes that if you cheat on anything else, then it really does not matter because you're going to fail the course anyways. So if that's like the dynamic, you could tell your student that, hey, you cheated on this assignment but it's probably not going to lead you to success in the midterm and the final when things are locked down and then, but that depends on your course. So, yeah. Thank you, William. I've got two, two last questions that I think we, we, we should discuss. One is how does Gen AI perpetuate a coloniality of being, knowing and doing? And how do we, or how do you think we should uh, we should do to decolonize uh, Gen AI? So that's not an easy question, but I'm just wondering if any one of you would like to uh, answer this one. I can answer this. Um, I do like this question because AI perpetuates the idea that we are receptacles of knowledge. You know, knowledge comes to us and we absorb it, and it can come through us from any facet, and we're just inhaling it. Um, but rather knowledge is shared. And, you know, when we think about how far we've come to learn, we've come to learn from other people. We've come to learn from their experiences, from chatting, from learning about their backgrounds and who they are. And I think one of the really important ways of Indigenous, of, uh, indigenous ways of knowing is having conversations, right? Listening to other people, um, engaging in other people's experiences without thinking about documentation of of essays or or that kind of thing we're, we're talking about being in the world 
Uh, and so what I think is really interesting is that um, Gen AI doesn't necessarily include that kind of, or that kind of facet of, of learning. And uh, how we decolonize Gen AI, that I think is a much broader question that I cannot answer <laughs> um, at, at this time, but I would be interested to hear if anyone else. Uh, oh, someone has put in an article. Wonderful, yes. I will take a look at that. But if somebody else has an, another comment, I think that would be appreciated. Good, thank you. Does anyone want to answer this question in particular? It's not about how to decolonize, but I will just add on the first part. One of the like biggest problem with the AI is that the jurisdictory knowledge or who is controlling the knowledge because who is owning the AI company and where is this knowledge coming from and what is their perceived assumption of the what we are calling fact? These are th like some of the main problems with the AI. Chat GPT and anything that has to do with the generative, because where is where are you generating the data from? And of course, it's replicating what we're calling the power structure that was in the colonization and just replicating it in, in the digitalized form. So there is also digital colonization now. Now, obviously, it's a broad field, and actually, it's more on the rise right now with the with the evolution of like evolving of AI. So I would say it's very like a broad field to look at. There is not really an answer I can give at this moment. But yes, yeah, science and technology studies has been going really good on this approach because when we're talking about, I also talked about someone producing knowledge and someone feeding the knowledge and who is the producer matters a lot. Thank you. And there's last one, last, last one, one last question, sorry. Um, do you feel in general uh, you learn more when using AI? And I will just uh, end on that question because we have the philosopher corner at 11 and we need to make sure that everybody has the time to rest and get ready for the next session. But if uh, someone wants to take that one on, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah, maybe I would say the benefits of, of AI and the fear of it are both exaggerated. It's not really, it's not really changing the world the way it's anticipated for both like in the good or bad way. I, am I benefiting from it? Yes, but maybe mostly 25% to maybe if the best way 30%, but not more than that. It's not really as it's advertised. Also, it's not really as worse as it's feared or like warned upon. So yeah, it's fastening the process of searching, but it's also in creating new methods of looking and verifying. So it's just a, another model of learning. Thank you, Manzura. Maybe Gabrielle uh, or William or Jacqueline on this one, and then we uh, will finish. Um, I can share. So like in general, I think like when I'm playing with all these Gen AI tools, like technically, I think I'm learning more of things. Not, um, I mean, like, of course I, I have not been using it because I do not trust the information that it gives. I, I do not trust like fully, but like, I think I'm acquiring skills to how to like, for example, like uh, writing prompts and also like how to um, like uh, uh, make good use of these tools to kind of like facilitate the work that I'm working on. So I guess like in this uh, scope of learning, I would say I am <laughs> learning more, <laughs> acquiring new skills, I would say, in uh, when, when I'm using all these tools. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, one last word from Gabriel or William. Yeah, for me, I just try to use it for learning or understanding based questions and not those questions that I have to deal with, like the application of the knowledge, because though at that point, I should be, I should already understood the material and be able to do that myself. So that's how I try to, I guess, maximize my learning and just making sure that I actually understand the material because the midterm and the final is not where I want to find out that I don't actually understand what I'm doing. Gabriel, maybe a, a last reference to the kitchen knife. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, um, so I think um, my final thought is, again, I'll just repeat the point where um, AI is just as good as your understanding um, on how the AI works and on the subject matter. So I'd say um, most of the time, I agree with um, Manzura, um, students would opt to use it for efficiency, because just to maybe um, tell more about the culture in UBC is that um, everyone 
always has like two or three things on top of courses, whether it's volunteering clubs and everything. And so um, I think um, AI will always be a beneficial tool for students in terms of efficiency. But I think with that, because not everyone understands um, how AI works and like what it can do and more importantly, what it cannot do. I think it is much more important for us to uh, not be scared of AI, but to teach ourselves first how to use it so that we can teach the students how to use it more. Because I think at this point, um, it's kind of hard to police um, students to not use AI. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for for your outstanding contribution today. Uh, I really, really want to thank all the panelists for the time that you spend with us today. Uh, I'm sorry for finishing a little bit late, uh, but there's a, a next session at 11, the uh, Philosopher Corner. So I will leave it to Lucas, but again, thank you so much for your particip participation. Bye.